welcome back uh, to Yakaima TV. Thank you for watching our channel. Today our guest is uh, Svilan Ranjelov, co-founder and CEO of uh, Dronamics, uh, based in Bulgaria and in the UK. And we are going to talk about large unmanned cargo aircrafts, large drones with, uh, with, with uh, a larger amount of cargo. Uh, so welcome, uh, Svilan. Thank you very much for uh, having this interview with you. Uh, could you explain a bit about your company because you're not just developing a, a drone, but you do uh, a lot more? Uh, thank you, Peter. Thanks for having me here. Yes, that's correct. Um, while we started this uh, focusing on how to build the most fuel efficient uh, cargo drone, um, we quickly realized that um, a drone in and of itself uh, is not as useful as the whole end-to-end uh, -end service. So we realize we have to build um, uh, the different components uh, to service to, to provide that service because mm -hmm. ultimately in cargo the customers don't necessarily care what kind of vehicle you use uh, whether it's a drone or a balloon or donkey but as long as you can meet their price yeah. and, and yeah. you can meet the delivery time yeah. so i'm going to share my screen and um, just uh, show you real quick what i mean um, we have um, three main components of our system that we use um, and they all have to be standardized because again in cargo um, you need to have very low cost uh, um, and, and the only way to, 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 to provide low cost is to make sure you're very standardized, um, you're very efficient. Mm. So first, um, the first element is the drone ports. Uh, these need to be, um, imagine, uh, these need to be village friendly. So this means is uh, our drone has to be such that it can land on whatever pretty much a bush plane can. Mm -hmm. And we focused on a drone the size of a small delivery van, so with 350 kilograms capacity, um, because uh, we realized that that's uh, a very versatile uh, form factor that would allow us to, uh, to really service the middle mile very well. So... Um, so the drone itself, you can see here, is um, uh, is a fixed wing drone with a uh, with a propeller engine in the front. Now, what, what this video is from a small scale uh, test we did a while back, but the full scale uh, drone is about 50 feet wingspan or 16 meters, and um, and it weighs uh, almost one ton. Okay. Full. Okay. And so, so you have the three parts, the standardized drone port, drones, and the flight control system. That's correct, now, yeah. Talking about the drone ports, uh, I guess that the size of uh, a drone like this could also land on, an, let's say, an existing, an existing air, small airport, or even uh, close to an industry uh, location where they have a, a motorway or something not used, being used. So why a, a dedicated drone port? Yeah, so... Well, um, the, because we want to go as, as far as 2,500 kilometers mm -hmm. when it comes to the range, that means that uh, it's way more efficient to do a fixed wing form factor rather than a vertical takeoff vehicle. And, and that means that takeoffs and landings will necessitate a runway. In our case, the runway requirement is uh, very um, uh, shortened because we need only about 400 meters runway space and that's runway doesn't have to be paved so we've optimized our landing gear designing in a way to accommodate that so yes we can land on um, I mean it, most roads can accommodate a one ton uh, car so they can accommodate a one ton um, flying vehicle landing there but yeah. also some um, you know gravel or uh, grass uh, strips can also serve that Okay. The idea really is most big cities around the world have only one airport, so one gateway, whereas industry is all over the city. So why don't we open the, the opportunity to a single city to have multiple gateways? And that's really going to allow us to sort of fractionalize the load into these chunks of 350 kgs to perfectly match the first mile vehicle. Okay, so, so you are developing the three, the three parts. Yes, uh, and you are talking with potential customers, or who who are your customers? Are they the cargo companies, or are they new, let's say, disruptive, non-existing companies so so far? So uh, there's uh, several categories we've focused on. One is um, e-commerce companies, 
um, who are very keen to optimize as much as possible while uh, their, their um, fulfillment. And, and they have uh, been building uh, distri uh, distribution centers um, around each country. So they're one good category um, mm -hmm. that we're after. Pharmaceutical companies, as well as um, industrial spare parts. Um, and where, whether we go after them directly or we go via their existing logistics partners, um, existing forwarders or, or couriers, that's really up to the end customer to decide how they want to do that. Okay. And we are really providing that backbone. So it, when it comes to Europe, um, you have 300 uh, commercially used airports right now, but more than 3,000 airstrips. That's only the airstrips. Again, not talking about logistics centers and, and other potential sites. So the opportunity really is very big to create a dense network that you can then serve. So, so if the customers um, um, are looking at a you know really good and reliable coverage in Europe, we would be sort of that infrastructure provider. Uh, you can think of us as sort of like a telecom company that builds those towers, the towers being the drone ports in this okay. sense. And yeah. And what about the, the let's say the third part, which is the, uh, the the remote control? Yeah. Are you supplying the pilots, or 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 are you? Do you have sort of central uh, control centers uh, in Europe? Is that the plan? Yes, uh, both. We so uh, the whole purpose of of this again is looking back at what cargo needs. They don't need pilots to be permanently engaged with um, the vehicle in the sense that um, y if you're flying A to B, it's fairly easy to automate and mm. and, um, and and to get clearance from the regulators to for that particular route. So the risk is diminished and then the human engagement is also diminished. Uh, we need that in the sense of uh, the way that you need to have an air traffic control system. So um, yes, we have humans at the endpoints at each of these drone ports. They will be staffed uh, with our personnel that we train, and um, and they will be in charge of the takeoffs and landings and you know the the, the cargo handling. But uh, all the uh, but you still need a center like this to oversee the whole fleet, the whole network, and engage uh, the different vehicles while they are in flight in case of an emergency or in case you know the authorities demand us to change course or um, there's weather conditions or so on, like basically managed by exception. Okay, okay. So, um, so what is the, the timing? I mean, you have done tests with a smaller scale drone. Yeah. Uh, so what, what is your plan? Because there is also regulation and certification, which is uh, obviously very important. That's true. Yes, so <clears throat> the EU has um, some new drone regulations. Um, we would be um, applying for certification in the EU, um, which would then serve to uh, to open other markets beyond the EU as well. Um, we are in in terms of uh, production development phase. We are excuse me. We are looking at uh, end of this year for um, the full scale prototype to be built. This is when I get to shave and then uh, uh, doing tests with it uh, over the the next year. Um, with the view to potentially do commercial flights um, in 2021 uh, and 2022. Oh, it's, that's pretty fast. Pretty it is. And part of the reason is because we use a certified engine, we use gasoline. So like we, we don't, a lot of other vehicles, they use electric motors and, and so on, which are not certified for aviation yet and, um, and batteries, which not have been certified for aviation yet. So they're taking on a lot of technical risk that we don't. So we're definitely, we made these decisions on purpose precisely because like I said, the customer doesn't care what technology you use. Um, so we wanted to optimize for what's available. Okay. Okay. So if I understand it correctly, you are a sort of, let's say telecom operator, that's your plan. And you have your, your network, your region wide drone port network, you have your your license, your cargo drones, is, is, is that the idea? Yeah, and we're also open to other systems as well. So mm -hmm. I know this uh, this is uh, growing. I mean, we've known each other for a long time and uh, you know, the community has grown 
tremendously, yeah. which is really great. And definitely this, like many other markets, is, uh, is unlikely to be served by only one player anyway. Uh, in, it, it, we would be happy to collaborate with other companies as well. Mm-hmm. Um, for the time being, though, again, we see that uh, we seem to be the ones that are closest to market. So as soon as we have uh, other vehicles that are market ready, we are um, happy to test and potentially integrate them into our service because okay. ultimately we want to be a, like an airline. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you have uh, you have plans for regional factories or something? Is that correct? Yeah, um, that's correct. So we we know that uh, this technological revolution is enabling um, it, for this to happen at a very large scale and Part of that means uh, building the production capacity for that mm-hmm. uh, to happen. And uh, we've been working uh, very hard on that. Um, we already have a small sort of a test factory facility right next to Sofia Airport. Um, it's a 10,000 square foot uh, facility and we can build uh, a number of drones uh, simultaneously there at the time. And we would be... Uh, learning, uh, taking those learnings and scaling them up so that we can have a factory to service all of Europe and then eventually build factories like that uh, or have them built with potential partners in other regions of the world. So oh. it makes no sense to ship the drones from Bulgaria to India, for example. Like India is perfectly capable of building these uh, themselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then the, 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 the last last question, uh, I see on the slide uh, that you are a strategic partner of IATA. Uh, uh, could you elaborate a bit on that? Sure, yes. Uh, so we became a strategic partner of IATA. Uh, we were the first ones for drones. We became that in 2018. And uh, the reason we did that was because, uh, uh, well, not a... Uh, not a rulemaking body like in the way that IK or uh, or IAS or FAA is. Um, IATA's voice is really, really well uh, heard. Um, and we see that even now during COVID that uh, they're doing tremendously great job of uh, pushing for more open borders and less quarantine for pilots and so on, because really um, the global economy cannot survive without aviation no. and, and air cargo. And I believe uh, it's a it's a it's a time where um, more than ever they their voice is heard in at, you know at G G eight and all that. So what will be um, so this was really a, a, something we were looking forward to to as we um, as we innovate and we take a lot of learnings from the actual process of. Uh, development and also looking at the potential operations uh it's really a mutual relationship where we both sides learn uh from each other okay okay good well thank you very much for this uh, for this interview and explanation of your company and before we, we close uh i always end uh, an interview with a personal question because there is a uh, there is there is a uh, sweden Randolph, the let's say the innovator, the, the initiator of uh, high-tech stuff, but there's also a person behind him. I'm always interested to find out who's your favorite musician or artist or food or city or book or writer. So uh, I'm, I'm curious to learn from you. Well, um, as favorite city, uh, I really like Hong Kong and London. Uh, yeah. I think these are two of the world's uh, greatest cities. Um, in terms of... Um, in terms of favorite musician, uh, perhaps not a lot of people know that um, uh, I used to play guitar. We had a band in high school. We were uh, really, yeah. But th- so in in another life, uh, I was going to work hard at uh, getting a career as a musician. But um, at some point, I realized, uh, you know, the world. Uh, there's a lot more that I can find out about the world, and I wanted to do that. <laughs> So just just a short question: Which type of music then, in that case, if you're a guitar player? Well, I was partial to anything with a guitar. So ah. uh, we're talking about uh, anything from hard rock to uh, you know to uh, I don't know ska and all that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's so. so. Okay. So thank you very much for for this interview, uh, and also now this interview comes to an end. Uh, I think the 
watchers of this channel uh, and this interview uh, for watching us and uh, hope to see you next time because we are going to interview other speakers on 3D printing, Internet of Things uh, and uh, 4D printing and materials. So uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.